That's awesome. Okay. Especially because I'm not a teacher, so that works out very well. So good morning, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Everyone and Michael. <laughs> so we're here to talk about LRMI, as you can tell. Uh, we have a distinguished panel, not all of which will fit here at the table, so we're going to do some rotating and things. My name is Michael Johnson, and I'm with Full Potential Associates, and my involvement with LRMI goes back to before the beginning, as they say, and I'm one of the representatives from the board of AEP who's been working with many different folks uh, to bring LRMI to the realization that it is today and to hopefully move it forward. So the big work with LRMI started in early 2011 when the people from Bing and Yahoo and Google got together and started a, um, an effort called schema.org. So schema.org basically is designed to allow for the metadata tagging for discovery for what we would call the, the main aspects of a thing, a title, creator, those kind of things, which would go with that thing being described anywhere that it was. Then as that work began to, began to move forward, they decided that there would be certain domain areas of which education is one that had specific elements that were important about the main thing that made them more interesting or important in the domain area, ours being education. So schema.org and working with the uh, Gates Foundation came and approached AEP and said, you guys are the organization that, in their opinion, best represented the educational publishing community. Would you be willing to participate with the Creative Commons to add to the schema.org the elements which are most critical, which best define a thing as an educational thing? Using the word thing a great deal, because we are talking about very rapidly moving targets when we're talking about the type of content involved here. So I, am, uh, I have the great pleasure of just introducing the panel and getting out of the way so the interesting stuff can happen. We're going to hear more about specific aspects, the what's and the why's and things like that from the panel themselves. So, but I'm just going to give you a brief overview. So in essence, what is LRMI? So it's, uh, the purpose of LRMI is to create the markup language, to create the um, instructions, if you will, tagging the stat for the standard, which has been released, which does describe the specific educational aspect of the resource being described. Uh, we're going to go into talking about uh, how search and discovery happens. We're going to talk about where we currently are. We have uh, about a dozen publishers participating already, various stages. As was mentioned in Lee's remarks this morning, we will have an even larger demonstration available at uh, ISTE at the end of the month. And there'll be more details coming from the speakers about that. And uh, as was also mentioned this morning, AEP in cooperation with Creative Commons and a host, and I do mean a host of other interested parties, uh, supported and guided uh, very well with great cooperation from the Gates Foundation to make all this stuff happen. Um, so I'm going to do a quick panel introduction, and then I'm just going to basically turn the mic over and get going. So Brant Reed, who will be our first speaker, Senior Technology Offer for Educational Programs at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, he has a long background in digital media and education. Uh, I think we just kind of stop guys our age, just say long. We don't really go into any further details. We've been at it a while. Uh, and uh, his background has a wonderful mix of technology. And uh, he understands the impact of technology and how an effort like this could have a positive impact on education. So Brant will be our first speaker. Greg, where's Greg? Oh, there's Greg right there. So Greg's here with his homemade ID there. Um, so Greg focuses on open educational projects at Creative Commons. He's the Educational Technology and Policy Coordinator at the Creative Commons. And he, like Brant, have been tremendous supports and, and uh, very involved in this effort. Um, and he just got here last night, so he's, he looks pretty good. He always looks good. Uh, the, the last speaker, thank you, yeah, you're welcome. You can just pay me later. Uh, the last speaker is actually a set of speakers. That's Michael J. who if you don't know Michael J. then you're in the wrong conference, but that's Michael J. back there. Uh, Steve, 
Where's Steve? Steve's in the back, in the middle there. Steve Nordmark from uh, Novation. And Mark's right here from Agilix. So the speakers, you'll, you'll notice as they start to talk that the work kind of breaks down into the what and the how and the where and things like that. So without any further ado, I think we'll just go ahead and move right into it and we'll do, uh, we don't have to change. I think we get to start with this machine. Mm -hmm. Yay. Okay. So here we go. So my task, uh, for which I've only been allocated 15 minutes, and uh, hopefully we can cruise through this, is to try and uh, put LRMI in context with a bunch of other stuff. Uh, the, uh, the data standards work that uh, our previous panel talked about, the shared learning collaborative that the Gates Foundation is uh, sponsoring, and a number of other moving parts in that. And so as, as we start, it, start to get into this, um, I, 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 uh, Michael actually suggested that maybe I give some context about the theory behind what we're trying to accomplish. This is actually going to, uh, in a moment, uh, will relate to uh, one of Ross's, uh, or I'm, I'm, not, I'm sorry, Jack Buckley's uh, slides earlier, but I'm going to start with control theory because I come from an engineering background. Uh, my father and, and brothers and a bunch of people are engineers, and as a computer scientist, I barely qualify uh, to work with those people. But something you get in engineering is this whole idea of control theory. You have a system, uh, that system has an output, and you have a reference of what you're trying to achieve, and you, can tr and you do an input there. And you can think of this as a car, for example. The system is the engine and the drivetrain. The output is how fast the car is moving. The input is the uh, position of the accelerator and the brake, and uh, your controller uh, may be a human or maybe the cruise control in the car, and your reference is how fast you want to go. And an open uh, loop system, which is what this is, you have to have in your control a really excellent mathematical model of how the system performs or else you're not going to get a predictable output. And if something breaks down, uh, the controller just keeps right on pushing, uh, even if something broke down because you have no sensing on the output. So any good control system has uh, what we call a feedback loop. So it has a sensor on that output, feeds that back to the controller and uh, gives us a more uh, precise result because the controller then is comparing the feedback to the reference and adjusting what's going on. Interestingly enough, this works in education it's extremely well. And you just uh, change the terms and, uh, and you get the same, re uh, and you get a s similar system. So what we have then is if we assess uh, the skills of the student and use that feedback to, uh, to manage what we're doing, and teacher there is, is, is a, uh, a placeholder for the entire instructional system, but, uh, but I, I like to keep in mind that what we're trying to do always is not take the teacher out of the loop. That doesn't work very well. What we're trying to do is inform the teacher uh, along with the curriculum and those kinds of things. And we have these activities that uh, help the student understand skills and then we assess them and, and feed that back into the system. For this to work, that feedback has to be frequent, fast, and rich. And, uh, and unfortunately, because the cost of, uh, of assessment um, our existing educational programs don't have as frequent, fast, or rich feedback as we would like to have. So the overall theory, um, if you can think of that, that we're approaching with all of these standards, and I'm going to get into a whole mess of different standards and how they fit together. Our basic theory is to say, let's increase the frequency, um, the rapidity, and the richness of the feed that we that we give to the student. And in that process, then we can in improve the instructional materials because we'll know how effective they are. We'll be more effective teaching the student even with the existing materials. And, uh, and we will uh, help the teacher deal with the load, the cognitive load of understanding uh, what's going on with each of the students in, in the class. So, uh, the, uh, so from this, we've developed at the Gates Foundation this personalized learning model. This is how we kind of synchronize our work uh, within the education technology groups there. And uh, you can see that around the outside, we have that feedback loop kind of portrayed slightly differently in terms of what the student sees. What don't I know that I should? How do I learn this? How well did I do? And we cycle that loop um, as much as we can. That then centers on these three things. The student data is really the collection of all the evidences we have of what that student understands so far. Uh, the content, of course, of the learning activities, uh, the assessment or the assessment activities, and all of that then gets aligned to a set of learning objectives. So that when I look in my student data, that evidences of what they know. It's according to a taxonomy of of 
understanding that toxan taxonomy is those learning objectives. And we have a bunch of standards that uh, are helping us with each of these things. So this is probably the best way I can tell you to say, well, that's where CEDS works. SIF and PASCA are also up there in the student data. LRMI and Learning Registry. Learning Registry is actually all over the place. I, I dropped it in that spot, but it's, it's really all over the place on this because it's a way of exchanging all of this kind of information. Uh, but that's one good place for it. LRMI, of course, is how we represent the alignment of the learning objectives to the student data. We have our common core state standards there as our taxonomy, at least, that we're using to start with. The 50 states have their core standards, and we have international standards um, and uh, taxonomies as well to work from. We really look to the uh, to the W3C, augmented by the IMS uh, with some of their packaging formats for the content. And uh, of course, you've heard of QTI and APIP uh, on the assessment. So this is kind of our mapping of what we're, we've got. And so, so I'm going to talk about those things. Uh, but before I get to that, one more framework to be thinking of. And this is something that uh, we came up with um, almost a year ago as we were looking at what is the scope of what CEDS does. Um, and, but this model works for all kinds of data standards, not just for CEDS. And it's a layer of, of at the data dictionary level, you're just saying these are the elements and this is how we define them. And uh, one of the classic uh, discussions that came up um, in, uh, in the CEDS work was uh, when they were defining elements related to discipline. And of course, CEDS uh, spans K-12 and post-secondary education. And uh, the guys who were involved in the discussion told me about it later, that they were talking for about 15 minutes and could not communicate. And they didn't know what the barrier was until they realized the K-12 people thought of discipline as managing classroom from behavior and problems. And the post-secondary people were thinking of uh, what is your major emphasis? <laughs> and and it, it's just amazing how a single term, but so the data dictionary gives us crisp, crisp definitions that, uh, that span those uh, spaces. And that's a huge contribution that the CDS has given us. And then uh, the data model where we start to cluster those elements into entities. And you saw the ER diagram that uh, Jack Buckley had put up of how those things fit together. CDS is actually getting into uh, the serialization as well, partly because it's just very useful uh, to give us a representation of that data model. They don't, find, they don't call it prescriptive, but it's a valuable contribution as well. So this red line that I have here isn't, isn't a perfect thing. But as you move down that stack, you have easier interoperability among systems. If you standardize all the way to the protocol level, then, then uh, systems integration involves just typing in some configuration configurations and pointing things at each other. On the other hand, you have greater longevity and broader application of things higher up in that stack. So as anybody works on a data standard, kind of understanding that balance uh, of the stack is useful and knowing exactly what the standard is trying to define is, is a helpful thing as well. So. Uh, uh, we're, we'll start with schema.org, which has already been uh, introduced as, as this, this joint effort by Bing, Google, and Yahoo. And, uh, and this is a, a great opportunity to get into, this is a cultural event now uh, for, um, if, if you're in LRMI, you have to, oh, except that I've got to connect to the internet. I forgot to connect first. Hang on, guys. Just a quick uh, connection here. Um, but uh, if you are into uh, LRMI, you have to do the potato salad demo. So we are going to do the potato salad demo. Uh, and uh, this is as we started to conceive of what might happen if we could inform the search engines with educational information. And, uh, and so w you can do this yourself. Um, so if you search for potato salad, sure enough, we come up. Now, the interesting thing is that this was uh, kind of an experiment by Google. I, I haven't talked to the actual people who did this, so I don't know for sure how deep of, they thought of it as an experiment and how much they thought of it as just another way to make money. But uh, they went and they published a metadata standard for recipes to see how much uptake there would be. Uh, how many people would actually mark up their recipes with this metadata. It turns out an enormous number of websites did so. And the result is what you see here. If I search for potato salad, Google says, oh, a bunch of the hits are actually recipes. And here are the ingredients because the metadata then tells them in a recipe, this part of it is the ingredients. Here's how long it takes to cook. Here are the calories. I can say, okay, I like my potato salad with mustard. I don't put tequila in my uh, potato salad because I'm a Mormon, I don't drink. 
and, uh, and so then I can reduce the number of, um, of hits. Now, if, if you can imagine then, what, do, what would this mean if instead of searching for potato salad, I search for polynomials? And down the side, it comes up and it says quadratic equation, factoring polynomials, um, third order polynomials, fourth order polynomials. And I had a set of learning objectives over there. And I could say, oh, I'm looking for these. And what if uh, on top of that, it said stuff appropriate for um, college level students or appropriate for eighth grade algebra level students. And I can pick those sorts of things. And I can say, I want a video or I want an interactive activity. And I can start to use those, that search bar to do that sort of Thing. That's our goal with this. And so in LRMI, what we're trying to do then is take what schema.org gave us and do something very similar for education. So back into the presentation. Um, so as we uh, define, went into LRMI, then one of the other things that we talked about is that uh, there have been a number of learning, re the most well known is the Learning Object Metadata Standard, LOM, and there are several others. So we're not the first ones to say, hey, let's define metadata for, um, for education. And in fact, uh, one of the first things we did was got this marvelous report of the other taxonomies of educational metadata and compared those and decided what did we want to lift, what did we want to change. But a fundamental difference of LRMI from previous efforts is that the previous efforts tried to encode the taxonomy. And uh, we started with the premise that the taxonomy exists, uh, somebody else is going to worry about how to encode it, and all we want to do is reference it. So, uh, so this diagram tries to, to present that idea of um, we just presume that there is a taxonomy of competencies, that they have uh, identifiers on them, and then we're saying, how do you describe the content and its relationship to those competencies? Greg will get into more detail about how that's actually done. Um, but then we get into this next problem of what about identifiers for the common core, which is what we're using to model this thing. And uh, it turns out that when we started this process, the only identifier format we had was that dot notation, except that you have to strip off the ccss.math, and all you saw was 6.ns.3. Well, 6.nns3 defines a particular math standard, but it also defines some cog on a Ford automobile. Or, I, it's, not, it's not globally unique uh, in the world. And so we need a unique identifiers. And so we actually, there's a parallel project for the identifiers for the Common Core State Standards. This is work being done by student achievement partners with the uh, CCSSO and NGA, which are the, who are the publishers of the Common Core Standards, to say, OK, let's come up with um, common identifiers for the common standards. That's a good idea, right? And, uh, and they're publishing them in three formats. These are the three formats that you see. The one that LRMI will use is the URL format because it references everything in the form of URIs and without getting into the difference between a URI and a URL. Suffice it to say the URL is one form of URI and, and we're in great shape here. And uh, so that's, that's a, a parallel project, an important one, but we ran into something else. Uh, and uh, this is the actual standard, 6.ns.3. And it says, fluently add, subtract, multiply, and divide multi-digit decimals using the standard algorithm for each operation. Well, I don't know about you, but I see at least four learning objectives there, uh, possibly more. And, uh, and that is the level of the identifiers that we're getting out of that project. So if you talk to... Uh, particularly the assessment consortia, the Race to the Top Assessment Consortia, and also other organizations, they're all saying, hey, we've got to parse this down to a finer grained level. So uh, I, we have a project uh, <coughs> under development. We have proposals in at the Gates Foundation. It's a coordinated thing of uh, three foundations and, and uh, two consortia and a whole bunch of other groups. We're all coming together, and hopefully there will be an announcement, a formal announcement within the next week and a half, I think we're fig figuring that out, of a group to come together and say, we don't want five different breakdowns. We want one, and here's the people that are all going to work on that uh, fine-grained um, uh, breakdown and, and es establish these are the identifiers that we use, at least among this cluster of people when referencing the common core at a more fine-grained level. Uh, next, uh, we have the learning registry. And thankfully, we got uh, um, Steve's uh, descri detailed description of the learning registry. What I'm showing here is what does a learning registry assertion look like 
uh, when it's using LRMI. So we can use LRMI as one of the vocabularies. As, as Steve has pointed out, the learning registry lets you share metadata without being prescriptive about the format. Uh, LRMI is contributing one format that you can use in the learning registry. And uh, the learning registry is composed of these assertions, these statements you make about something. And the particular statement we're making in this case is that uh, um, this particular video in the Khan Academy teaches this particular learning objective. The interesting thing is that uh, that assertion actually came up from an existing web page. If you go to khanacademy.org slash common core, they will list all of the Common Core standards and, uh, and which uh, content on the Khan Academy aligns to that. But it's a human page. I, I can't send a, an indexer to that and be able to index that in structural form. And so that's what uh, we are trying to do with the LRMI in, in this. Uh, the other things that the Learning Registry adds to that is the provenance, who said so and when did they say it. Um, and then they have a digital signature to make sure that we don't have these things forged, that somebody claims to be uh, Khan Academy and wh when they weren't really uh, that. And this gives us a framework of how LRMI and the, L and the learning registry fit together. Um, so, uh, and, and I kind of divided this into, the, into these four layers, which are different from my previous four layers, but that's okay. Uh, so you have the vocabulary. This is like the data dictionary. This is what we're trying to say. Um, and then we have the purpose, why we're saying that, how, do, how does it get encoded, and how do we distribute it across the world. And the schema.org framework is that we're trying to uh, have search engines crawl and index that information. And, uh, and they encode that using HTML microdata. So you have an HTML page, and you embed the metadata within that HTML markup so that the search engine can find it as it comes across. One of the disadvantages of doing that is that the person who can put up the microdata is the person who publishes the web page. Nobody else can do that. And microdata does have a way of, on one page, saying this thing is aligned to that. But the search engines tend to discount that kind of information. They like to take the information from the author of the page. And so it makes it difficult for other people to make assertions about your content in the form that, that uh, Steve's example was before. Uh, but, it, but it is a really valuable way of, of getting the data out there in the first place. And then, of course, you see the distribution of web crawling of, of how they get that. So the learning registry is, has a slightly different purpose of exchanging data among systems. Um, the encoding uh, can be uh, LRMI. Um, it's typically XML or uh, JSON, although theoretically you could use something else. And the distribution is through replication among peer learning registry instances. LRMI vocabulary that we put on the top really works in both systems. And in fact, as part of our LRMI effort, we've kind of <laughs> projected the entire schema.org vocabulary into learning registry, which makes a, a really handy uh, thing to work with. And uh, so, you, th but uh, hopefully this kind of gives you an idea that these things actually are very synergistic. They have different approaches, but uh, they can be used together in, in a coordinated fashion. And, uh, and the final thing that I'm going to dig into here, and this is a subject that we can spend days and days on and actually have, uh, but I'll try to hit it very lightly. Uh, many of you may have heard of the Shared Learning Collaborative um, at the Gates Foundation. This is uh, our most ambitious education technology effort that we have going on right now. And uh, it's an alliance of states, foundations, educators. It's co-funded uh, by the Gates Foundation and the Carnegie Corporation. We have five pilot states, uh, 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 wave one pilot states, I should say. We have four more on the wings. And those are New York, Massachusetts, Colorado, Illinois, and North Carolina. And each of those states has picked uh, one or two districts that are actually going to deploy this system. And the purpose of the Shared Learning Collaborative is to say, OK, we have all this data that you heard Ross and Jack talk about that's being collected into these state systems, that's being reported up to the feds, that's showing compliance with regulations and showing some sort of form of improvement and so on. That data isn't getting back to the teachers and the students. And our goal is to get that data into the hands of the teachers and students and likewise uh, collect the more fine-grained data, hopefully from uh, learning systems and innovative things that are coming together. So you see this application layer. The interesting thing about the application layer is that's what's not being developed uh, by the SLC. We're, uh, we're 
developing a community of commercial vendors and not-for-profit vendors and whoever else wants to participate to build that. Instead, we're building this uh, the student data store, which hooks in to, uh, through ingestion services with those state and local data systems, loading that up and with a security and permission system so that you can be sure that only the people who are authorized to see the student personal data can get at that. And then that flows up. What's most important for this community is what's on the right side. That's the student data services on the left, but on the right side is, is that mesh with the content so that we can take the student data and say, what content does that tell us uh, would be relevant to that student needs, that feedback loop that I talked about initially. And, uh, and so with that, uh, we are building an instance of the learning registry that has an index on top, the learning registry index, so that we can actually query that registry for assertions that we know about. What content teaches this subject? Uh, what, uh, what, um, uh, oh, I, I didn't get into this before, but uh, I was talking about the, the finer grained um, standards within the common core standards. One of the things that we trip up is we want to call those substandards, and that's really not a good term to use. <laughs> so what micro standards uh, are, are, are correspond to this, uh, to this standard? Um, and, and I've got an identifier of a piece of content. Where can I actually go find that content? I've got an identifier of a standard. What's the definition of that standard? Those are the kinds of things that we expect to query from the learning registry, and we need an index on top of that learning, all of those assertions in order to be able to uh, bring coherent results from that. So that's uh, a key part of what's going on is the data about the standards, the data about the content, all uh, being exchanged through a learning registry system with that index on top and using the vocabulary of LRMI and uh, other related things. Uh, final point is that the student data store in the SLC is based on the common education data standards uh, with interfaces that use um, EDFI and, and CIF uh, serialization formats and so on. And, uh, and I could speak for hours on how all these things fit together. Um, but uh, better for you to either look at the resources that I have listed here or come talk to me uh, afterwards. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, you're next, right, yeah, Greg? Especially check out the last link, Brant's blog. That puts it all together. <laughs> I actually do have elaborations of a lot of this stuff out there, so. Greg, can I just say one thing quickly? Oh, yes. yes. I just want to let everybody know the slides are all going to be available. So I know that I hear a lot of typing, which is great, <laughs> but um, uh, we'll get them out probably within the next week. So you'll be able to get all of those. Yeah. Thank you. Good you, have, you have three seconds. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It'll be gone in three seconds. Three, two, one, no more links. All right. <laughs> is that me? That's probably me. All right, so I'm gonna talk about how we got to this point, basically, with LRMI specifically. So the development of the actual spec, the specification. Um, so first of all, we spent a lot of time putting together a technical working group, and there's a few of those people in here, including Brent and myself, Steve, um, and Michael, and who else is in here from the working group? Did I see Lee back there? I can't remember, but anyways, a lot of good people on this working group. Um, in fact, right, there we all are. There's probably, I think, 15 at the last count. Um, so we have someone from the school district, from JISC, the, the UK um, funding organization, um, university schools, uh, Creative Commons, Microsoft. So Microsoft, Charlie, is from the search, the, the Bing division of Microsoft. Um, we have OER platforms, other standards organizations like IMS Global and Dublin Core, and publishers. So we're a pretty decent technical working group there. We have, I think, a lot of different um, people represented and communities represented. Um, the whole point of this was, I mean, so the joke is, in standards world, crap, we have 11 standards. One should make one that encompasses them all. I'm gonna go do that. Hack away, hack away, hack away. Great, now we have 12 standards that don't agree anymore. <laughs> so the point of this is we can at least come to terms with what schema.org is doing among the interests of all these different people that are on the technical working group. So everyone that's involved in education, hopefully, that's what we were really shooting for is like the widest um, use cases in education. So 
I hope we achieved it. Um, if your use case was not addressed, I'm sorry. But I think we got it. I, I, don't, I can't think of one that's in this room that we didn't address. Um, so this is just, so I use MUT, uh, mail client. The most important thing of this line is just the 486. That's the number of messages that are in my LRMI and related folder for email. So since about mid-July of last year, that's the mailing list for the technical working group and the public LRMI mailing list. How much discussion happened about these things? Um, and that's just LRMI specific, not how it relates to other projects. So it was thoroughly discussed <laughs> by many, many people. Um, this is a badly, you can't really see it. It's just, and also deep discussions, very threaded discussions. It, it happens on, people go off and, and take tangents and we discuss for a little while about little different parts because that's what we do, we're metadata people. We take the details and, and take the details of the details and talk about the details of those details of those details. So it gets complicated. But what we came up with, so you can find most of the landing page, the original landing page was at the creativecommons.org wiki, um, just LRMI. That's just was a, our like working platform, basically just an easy place to put resources. Um, but the properties were developed also on the wiki initially. And this was all the editing that I had to do that wiki. This is one page of tons. So this, the whole point of this first few slides is tons of work was put into this. Um, there were also a lot of voice calls. This is just a bunch of the MP3s of all the, the conference calls. Four of the seven I think we had. I failed to record some of the conference calls. Um, but in short, it was a lot of work. So what did it produce? <laughs> um, so the specification. Uh, this is actually on the LRMI website. This is going live today. It's, it's available right now. You can go to lrmi.net. This is the 1.0 specification. We went through a few different drafts. We went through a bunch of public comment periods. Um, but this is it. This is what is submitted to schema.org. So schema.org has the option. So schema.org is basically controlled by the partners in the collaborative. It's, it's a hard word, it's a hard thing to describe because of antitrust issues. Google, Bing, and Yahoo can't really work together that closely without having antitrust issues, right? So it's like a collaborative type thing, but they can control what bits and pieces of metadata standards they agree upon and, and incorporate. So we proposed it. Um, it's being worked through by both the Schema.org community, so everyone that's interested in metadata online, semantic web stuff online, is really interested in Schema.org because it's gonna be the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Um, and then also the behind the scenes work with the actual members of Google, Bing, and Yahoo, and Baidu, and a couple others actually. Um, so this is it. This is it in a hopefully a little bit more readable format. So that's pretty much it, right? Um, these are all the terms that we found changed a resource, so any kind of web resource, into an educational resource. What are those specific things, those qualities, that make a resource that could have been just anything online, any kind of video? I mean, a video is not always an educational video. Most videos are not educational video on YouTube. But um, so you, what are the salient qualities that change it into that? So the, the real showstopper is the first one, so I'll skip it for a second. Um, the intended user role. So the individual group for which the work in question was produced. You know, is this work made for the teacher or is it made for the student? Is it even made for the parent? Is, what kind of role is that? Um, educational use, so the purpose of the work, um, time required, how long it takes an average student to complete it, typical age range. Yes, we went with age range as opposed to grade level because we wanted to be international. Um, there's still issues with age internationally, but it is the least tied to borders that we could do, basically. Um, and you can always have your mappings between typical age range for middle schoolers in the US. What does that make sense for grade-wise? Um, it's you know, pretty, you can, you can make that mapping and you can kind of guess that based off of the educational alignment term that I'll go back to. Um, so interactivity type, you know, is this uh, active? Is there a lot of participation? Is it expositive? Is it just lecture? Or is it some kind of mixed thing? Uh, learning resource type, so the predominant type or kind characterizing the learning resource, you know, is it a presentation, syllabus, things like that. Um, use rights URL, whether the URL where the owner specifies permissions for the resource, it can be anything from a public license to terms of service, whatever you want, just a place that you can say to the user, not to the search engines, but you can say to the user, 
how you can use that content um, and is based on URL. So if it's a derivative or like there's a bunch of different pieces that are coming into a single coherent whole, that's how you would do that. So back to the beginning, educational alignment. This is what we've been talking about this whole time, which is the alignment to standards, educational standards. Um, so what I alluded to before about um, guessing the typical age range with what country or what grade level that is, you know, if I say typical age range of 12 to 13 and I align it to a common core math standard, you can probably guess that's what, sixth to seventh grade. So that's where you can get around the grade level issue. Does anybody have any questions or, well, we can do those at the end, I guess. We can bring this slide back up. Um, and if you wanna pick it apart or whatever, I, we can do that. Um, so it's given out order collaboration. We, we worked with them a lot. Um, in fact, Charlie Zhang from Microsoft and the Bing division of Microsoft was on our technical working group. So we had a lot of input from them. Um, his participation, however, does not mean that he or Microsoft or Bing or Skin.org fully endorsed everything that we did. He was just basically an advisor along those roles. Um, <laughs> it is not a rubber stamp process. They did not just agree to everything that we did. Um, there was a lot of back and forth. We had a few calls, in fact, with, with a few different people to make sure that we weren't misguessing what they wanted, what we thought they wanted from us, basically. We didn't, we had some, like, some questions about what they were looking for from the educational community, and we kind of were going, um, making sure that back and forth happened, so we didn't propose something that was completely out of their scope. Um, because it's, in the world of educational metadata, you want to get really specific and nuanced really quickly. You can and we just kept having to stop ourselves in, um, in conversation with Skin.org of that's not the level at which the web works a lot of times. So those kind of conversations were very useful. Um, we are also, we, let's see how to put this, Skin.org is also working within the W3C community to enable this process of proposing new extensions, which LRMI is one of, to Skin.org. Um, so they have a mailing list, basically with W3C is really just a lot of infrastructure. Um, they just provide infrastructure and processes and templates so that you can create standards effectively and with a lot of great public input. So there's a mailing list that where all the discussion happens for scheme.org and that mailing list is a lot more <laughs> um, busy than the dollar my specific one. It is intense and if you really, really, really want to get into the, the nitty gritty of semantic web, if you know, the, the describing linked data and all that kind of stuff, this is where you wanna go. Um, it's a fun list, but um, in, it's a public list. Everything that is sent to it is, is archived publicly, so you can go back to the discussions. But this is where the scheme.org basically uh, community feedback and approval process happens. And that's where we spent a lot of time to make sure that everybody else outside of our specific education group knew and, and approved what we were working with. Um, we actually got a lot of good feedback from uh, Zoe Rose, who's from the BBC, um, because of a few different um, discussions that she saw and, and some blog posts. So there was surprise and very, very useful feedback from the open public comment period, periods. Um, that's just a link to, or a screenshot of all the different <laughs> discussions that happen on the W3C mailing list. I like numbers, I'm a numbers guy. Um, so next steps. Well, uh, scheme.org timeline. Let's see, I didn't put anything here, no. So scheme.org timeline, um, right now, they are doing a big um, kind of update of scheme.org. So they started out, they had their really long list of terms and definitions, and it was mostly, you know, things for recipes or your typical like SEO kind of stuff, like a hair salon and things like that. Like it got really, nuanced really quickly in weird ways that you wouldn't have thought of, um, mostly for people searching for you know, commercial businesses, like brick and mortar kind of stuff. Um, so they kind of stopped there. They added in the newspaper metadata um, from our news. I don't know if anyone in, is associated with them in any way, but the, um, what's it called? Crap, our news, um, oh, whatever. Organization. organization yeah. uh, International Trade Association of Publishers, or like news publishers kind of thing, um, like New York Times, BBC, et cetera, et cetera. They have their own specific metadata standard for describing news content, like articles and bylines and all this different kind of stuff. Um, they 
got on the ball really quickly and they used their kind of um, fast community process to put that in there, um, I think within, that was in no that October um, when that happened. So since then, there hasn't been any new additions to schema.org. So we, LRMI, along with a couple other um, community groups, have proposed new extensions to schema.org and these things are gonna be rolled out in the next dot, 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 kind of a little bit. They don't say it's Google, Bing, and Yahoo, kind of secretive about their exact dates. Um, they told me a week, like three weeks ago, they told me next week. <coughs> that didn't happen. Um, so, right, we'll, we don't know the exact date, but it's coming imminently. Um, we have our materials ready for that. So it'll be there and it'll be done, and that's kind of what it took. So we'll take questions later, but thanks. Hey, yeah. Just, uh, just talk a little bit about all of those targets for the intended target. We're not saying only this or should be that or whatever. But oh. The content creator intended this. So. Oh, like um, for the terms? Yeah. Right. So we're not being prescriptive in our vocabulary that you use to fill in these values. Um, so things like learning resource type or educational use or intended end user role or uh, even educational alignment, we're not saying which specific <laughs> vocabularies you should use to fill those things in. We're gonna let the communities that use this determine what is most <coughs> useful to them. Um, so you can kind of see this trend in this whole thing. Learning registry is not prescriptive on what metadata standards you use, and then the metadata standard isn't very prescriptive on what vocabulary you use because we can't do a top-down thing. It's gonna be a bottom-up kind of thing, and we're making the um, tools and infrastructure capable of being bottom-up in that respect, being very um, liberal in what you receive and conservative in what you send. So. Um, did that at all answer that question, or no? It was important. To okay. Me. So, so, I mean, the person who creates the content says, I intend this to be used by people of this grade. So, uh -huh. and then we're not going to look over their shoulder. You know, LRMI doesn't look over their shoulder and say it doesn't. Right. Okay. He'll clear it up. Thank you, sir. So, basically, there is no, you, anyone can say what they want about their own content, in a way. Right? It's kind of like a poorly rephrased of that question. So I'm, I'm publisher Greg and I'm putting my content online and I'm saying this thing aligns to this content over here or this standard over here. Um, how do we know that's useful information? Is that a good rephrasing? Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, that will, so part of that is solved with learning registry. If you wanna go through that route, you have multiple people describing the same content in the same way, then you can be fairly sure that it's probably that way. Um, or through authenticity, through um, uh, normal processes of uh, peer review. You know, if you trust this entity because that you know that they happen to always go through the process of getting peer review done for their materials before they publish them, then you can trust them personally a little bit more. Uh, in, in addition, there, is, uh, there will be a, a nice incentive around the, the whole schema.org, but uh, this as well, uh, just speaking to Google, because I know mm -hmm. their process a little bit better than the other ones, um, and they're also bigger, uh, they punish uh, bad performers. And right. so if you put grade level one, two, three, or age range, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right, you just put everything for everything, and then as they, they watch click-throughs, right, so as users click and then come back and click again, right, they know that you clicked on something that was not right, you clicked on the next link, and then they push that down on the link results. So mm -hmm. if you're not giving users what they want to see and users tell Google that through their click patterns, Google will punish you on their rankings. So there are some nice incentives that we right. get out of the organic search. Exactly. It, it kind of, the organic search does force good behavior in a way. It definitely, and I mean, Google is really good at this, like trying to harm SEO people that are just trying to do it just for the SEO, right? So it's, it can be, it'll be handled well, yeah. Cool. And I think with that, I'm done. So actually, uh, having created multiple of these systems for doing alignment, we had a name for those kinds of what we call the malignments. <laughs> so uh, I can't tell you how many malignments I've actually seen. 
Um, let's see. Sorry, I would, there's an item that I'm looking at. Is Dave here? Yeah. Where is it? Video. Yeah. This one right here, third down on the right. Oh, thanks. Oh. I know. Yeah, just close it. Yeah. It won't start on its own, will it? No. Okay, good. Thanks, guys. This is great to have a whole tech support group right up here. Um, uh, so just want to give some context um, for where we are right now with LRMI. Um, AEP was, of course, awarded a contract by the Gates Foundation to manage the, the whole process around LRMI. You heard from Michael Johnson the process that went through and working with Greg and facilitation. Um, once the, the spec had become robust enough, and now we actually have 1.0, um, but as we were moving into that, we really felt it was necessary to do a proof of concept. Um, it started out originally as a, uh, as a, a, you know, sort of an initial implementation. We sort of dialed that back to think about it as proof of concept instead. Um, so that we, that the mindset there is that we're going to try to inform how this process takes place, how it gets used, and use this as a way to be able to gather information. Go ahead. Keep going. Thank you. Um, and so... <clears throat> And so that's the process that uh, Educational Systemics, my organization, is working on. So um, we have right now 12 publishers that have agreed to participate in the proof of concept process. We have metadata that started coming in. There is a template um, that's available uh, to, uh, um, that you can fill out. You can export data from your existing uh, data uh, repositories. Um, that you may be keeping internally. Hopefully you have a content management tool of some sort and you can draw on that. And uh, so we're collecting some of that information. Um, and this is all funded. So you know, the question is why participate now? Um, there'll be an ongoing, certainly LRMI is going to have a long life ahead of it. Um, but, but in fact, the AEP is funded through the end of February to help you tag your stuff. Um, and uh, so what's the benefit of that? One is you're not going it alone. Um, and that's sort of nice to have some assistance so that, you know, you don't have to do the 40 years of wandering in the desert um, trying to figure out where, where, where you need to end up. Um, and so uh, we're working with uh, the group at Novation around doing the tagging process. Um, I have a person on my staff who is working in terms of cleaning up the data and providing feedback into what that data actually looks like. That's Kane Kamara, um, who's an intern, will be us, with us through the end of July, um, but she's working on that. David Longden, um, who has worked with me over the last 20 years, um, building uh, correlation tools and the like. Um, David is actually documenting that process, working with Novation through that, because the goal is that all of you should be able to tag. Um, but we don't want to like send you out with, unlike many organizations, we don't want you to get the beta version. Um, we want you to get at least late beta or gold master or maybe even a release version of a product to play with it and know what the, what the data flow, what the process is actually going to be as you're going through it. So that's really what we're working on. Um, another component to this, of course, is the marketing of LRMI. Um, really to make sure that there's an awareness about what LRMI is and um, not just on the part of you, the publisher community, but also on the part of users um, so that they have an expectation about how this is going to change their world and hopefully make a little bit more sense around that. So um, uh, there, we're going to see the first version, it's the first version, right Dave, of a video. I already, I, you know, I'm just being you know, totally anal retentive, found little tiny things, of course, um, that I want to see changed. But um, I think it's a good chance for you to see um, how some of this will be positioned in the marketplace, and that'll continue to happen um, on an ongoing basis. So I'm told I have to actually put the mic down to the speakers, which I assume are somewhere down here. So I'll get close, I think. Is that a speaker? It could be. I have to search for school many times a week. Well, I have to search for social studies, biology, language arts, reading, pretty much all of my classes that I take. Most of the time, I do not find what I need. I find overwhelming results, typically like thousands. It's like two million or two thousand. Like I just searched something and there were a million results. Ugh, that is so 
annoying. I'm really, really frustrated. Like, ugh. it just takes too long. So frustrating. It takes me a long time to find what I need. You have so many things to have to look through before you actually find what you're really looking for. Sometimes I find it, sometimes I don't. When educators and students search for instructional content and resources, they never know what they're going to find. What they do know is that they'll find thousands of hits and they'll need to spend way too long combing through the search results to find what they need. Right now, my students are spending way too much time searching for the information for the lessons they've been given. If I wasn't spending all my time searching, I could definitely focus on my children. I could be using that time to work on lesson plans or teaching. I wish there was an easier way for my students to find the relevant information. If we could sort by things like grade level or content area, searching could be so much easier. This would make it so much easier for me and my students. And it wouldn't just help me, it would really help parents working with their kids at home. The Learning Resource Metadata Initiative, or LRMI, is focused on making educational and instructional resources easier to find and more accessible for educators, students, and their families. The LRMI is a project co-led by the Association of Educational Publishers and Creative Commons. The project mission is to develop a standard metadata framework for educational content. When a critical mass of educational content is described and tagged in a consistent and uniform manner, filtering this content will become substantially easier for both users and delivery platforms. The framework will encompass the most commonly used and critical tags for instructional resources, criteria such as grade level, content area, standards alignments, copyright and licensing considerations, media types such as print, video or digital, and other search filters. If adopted by the major search engines, these filtering criteria will appear on the browser screen when educators and students conduct searches. By simply defining their search using these standard filters, they'll get the exact resources they need at the precise moment they need them. For publishers and content developers, it means that their products and programs will be more discoverable for the teachers and students who need them. It's so much easier for my students to use. It's so much easier. I have a lot more time now just to focus on teaching. I can spend more time doing my homework and less time searching. And my students are so much less frustrated and so much more excited to learn. I get less results, but they mean more. As a teacher, it really meets my needs. Yes! The Learning Resource Metadata Initiative, improving search for teaching and learning. So again, the, the main reason to share that with you is to recognize there's so many different technical initiatives that take place um, that end up being, at least from my perspective, you know, really innovative, successful, really could add, change the marketplace. But what they forget is to tell people about it. Um, and that's a big problem. So recognize that your participation in LRMI, which um, uh, really, this is the time to get involved, um, but your participation is backed up by an awareness in the marketplace about that, which supports not just your technical implementation, but also your implementation through your products and how they're found on the, on the web. So um, I know we'll take questions later, but we'll be happy to talk about that. And I'm going to turn this over to you, Great. Mark. Are they doing a computer swap? Yeah, I'll do a computer swap here. Okay. okay. Any quick questions while we're swapping computers? Is that video available, Michael? Uh, not yet, but it will be. Is that right, Dave? <laughs> yeah. We're going to make some tweaks to it. <laughs> yeah. When? When? <laughs> that wasn't for me. That was from Sue. So beat Sue up about that. Uh, within the next couple of weeks, we'll have, we have to redo a couple of things. So. Yeah. So everybody in this room on the LRMI mailing list now, and you'll know when that's ready. Um, 
Yeah, I do want to point out one thing actually that came out of uh, the, the top of uh, Greg's presentation, and that is that although there is not a predefined set of, of metadata uh, uh, controlled vocabulary, um, as part of the proof of concept, we in fact did define a recommended set of vocabulary. Just because what we found is that just opening up for everybody putting whatever they want to in a limited proof of concept really wasn't going to result in a searchable, findable kind of uh, repository. So again, we see that that may evolve. Yes? I'm just curious in the video it shows grade level and then the index it was age. So are you doing a translation of age? That would be so one of the things that was the good. first <laughs> comment. See, David's smiling because I immediately came back with that. So um, does anyone want to guess what the second one is that I found? You get a look at the second one. Um, media type and and resource type are actually combined. So digital versus video, those are not either ors. Um, you could search on a digital resource that also could be video or it could be in another instantiation. So we're, some of these little subtleties, see I knew this group would catch some of these things. Um, you'll find some of those. So. Great. Yep, Thank you. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, the magic in between that video. So remember they talked about here's what it could be and here's what it is. There's a little magic that happens in between there. So what we're going to talk about today um, is a little bit about the search and tagger applications that are being built in order to make that magic happen. Um, first, who am I? Um, Mark Litzel Schwab, Senior Vice President of Agilix Labs. I'm involved with both the Learning Registry and the LRMI projects. Um, Agilix Labs, if you don't know, is maker of the Brain Honey Learning Infrastructure and we do a lot of work about print to digital and creating product frameworks. Um, and specifically for this project, we're building infrastructure for search and tagger applications for the SLI. This project is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and we really treat AEP and all of you as our customers. And so what I'm trying to do today is talk about how far we've gotten and then try to solicit feedback from all of you on what we should do as far as interfaces, what you would use it for, what you wouldn't use it for, um, and how you'd like to direct the project. And so I'll talk about where we are in the process and why we're here uh, today here. Um, as the video nicely put, the problem is search overload. If you type in adding fractions, you get millions, millions of results. You get stuff for the teachers, you get stuff for the kids and so forth. It really doesn't meet the need. And what you're really trying to say, well, I'm looking for a lesson plan for third graders that I can teach adding fractions that align to common core standards from people I trust. But that's kind of hard to type. Um, <laughs> And so what we're really trying to get is targeted results that include both for fee and free materials. This is what people are really looking for. So there's a process that takes place here um, in order to make all this happen. LRMI is going to help you make your content discoverable. We start with the process of tagging content, which is putting, making an assertion about your content relative to the LRMI specification. That data that metadata about your resource is then published. Now you can publish it to Learning Registry. That'll be the default position of these tools. We'll push it to Learning Registry, but you can also modify these tools. They're all open source, so you'll be able to take it and push it to your own databases as well. So if you had your own system where you wanted to tag your content and just keep it internal, you could use these tools to do that as, as well. So it doesn't just have to be public. Um, it can be private as well. And at the same after it's been published, then the next thing is how do you recover it? So after you've taken the time to tag your resources, push it to Learning Registry or other source, then the next step is how do you search it? Um, and so we're going to talk about this process here, what tools we're working on. Um, search, again, could also be searching an index of Learning Registry. It could be searching Google. It could be Bing. Um, it could be any search engine you have. The tools are intended to be plugged into whatever search tools that, that you have. Now, there's many. Once you find something that's discoverable, the next pathway is how do people turn that into revenue. So a lot of folks here are talking about, well, what we're seeing today is a lot of search for free materials. What about for the things that I've published? How do I turn that into revenue? How do I do that? And that really comes down to the granularity question somebody asked earlier. Um, this type of search doesn't mean you have to find a resource I can use right now. It could be something that says, here's a program that deals with fluency for third grade readers. And that's something that may not be purchased on that moment, but it may be something that gets purchased the following, the following year. So discoverability of resources that you can't acquire is still actually a very valid use case um, and one that we should all con consider. Um, so where are we in this whole process? 
we're creating two applications, one called Tagger and one called Search. Um, not quite cloak and dagger, it's search and tagger. <laughs> yeah, metadata jokes are tough to come by. <laughs> they really are. Um, so we have, uh, we built the proof of concept. This is start, the project started about seven, eight weeks ago, um, where we started building out the tagger applications and the search applications. Um, we built the proof of concept of the tagger. I'll show both of these in just a moment. Um, in, an, in another six weeks or so, we'll have an early release um, of both the uh, Tagger and the Search applications, and then we'll have a final release towards the fall. So what I'm trying to tell you here is what you see here is a very, very early. It's just a few weeks' work on each, on each application, um, and the intent is to put something forward that you can react to and start giving us feedback. It's really important to get the feedback at this time because now is the time that we can make those changes. And we can still make changes later on, but the best time is now. So we have opportunities, and I'll go over emails and so forth, how to contact us. We're here at the conference. We have brought a number of folks. I'm going to introduce uh, Eric and Soraya. Do you want to stand up just for one second? Eric is the project manager for this, and Soraya is the lead developer. Um, so we brought these two here, as well as myself, um, to, to gather input. So the, uh, just to give you a little bit of details about the two applications, and I'll give a quick demo here. Tagger, um, its purpose is to tag content to the LRMI specification. Um, it has a set of general tags, so things like who published the content, um, what day it was published, those types of things, things that really fit into the schema.org side of things, and it also has a section for learning, which are all the LRMI pieces that are very specific to the learning application. Um, it will push the metadata to the learning registry or internal systems. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is an adaptable and open source platform. It's not intended to be a, a one site that somebody goes to and tags things. Um, it's intended to be something that we ha will have a reference implementation that will be publicly available on the Shared Learning Collaborative, but it's not intended to be the only <laughs> application. Um, and you can, you can also change the, the place where you store the data. So let me show you what we call the, uh, you know, you've heard the term minimal, minimum viable product. This is the barely usable product, so this is <laughs> one step ahead of that. Um, go full screen here. So the, uh, the concept is quite simple, that you have a way of entering your, your data here. And today it's manual entry because that's where we are with the barely usable product, but obviously we're adding things like you can bring in Excel spreadsheets, um, you, can, you can bring in other sorts of data and you can hook it up to your own data sources. So if you already have it in a database, you'll be able to push it in here. Um, but to just demonstrate the process, uh, you have a, a way of just typing in your title, comma, and a URL. And then when you go to tag this resource, you simply select it. Um, the tagger goes and loads the, the resource on the right-hand side and allows you to, to look at it while you're doing the tagging, which is really quite important. Um, see what you're actually doing. And then you're able to, to come, in, come in here and set things like the title of the resource, the URL, which is pulled from this first, first column um, topic. You could put in uh, your date, creator, publisher, et cetera. Um, and as you can also tag with the uh, learning resources, whether this is for a, a team of teachers or teachers. Um, one of the notes that Greg made is that we may suggest vocabulary here but it's not controlled vocabulary. You always have the concept of putting in other in there. So even though there's a suggested vocabulary based on the input of a number of folks, um, you can type your own. We really would love feedback on the suggested vocabulary because this is one area that everybody has their ideas um, and it can get very long or very short depending on how, how we end up doing the implementation. Um, obviously, the other things, typical age range, educational use, and so forth, and competency, we're, we're, this is a very early version about how you select the competencies. Um, we are going to bring it in so you can find them through the text uh, as well as the, the numerical indicators so it's more user-friendly or human-friendly. Um, and then once you're, you're done, it it's, puts the data out into a, a data format here that you can, you can take with you. This data can then be embedded inside of your web pages. It can be embedded into your CMS um, and made available to the search engines that are out there. Uh, so it's really just intended to show, you know, 
he, describe what you're going to tag, tag it, and then save the data. This, this data save will then also go to your, your own databases, the text files, and so forth, so you'll be able to take that with you instead of right now it's copy-paste. Um, again, barely usable. So, so that's the basics, excuse me, of the uh, meta-tagging um, application. And then the other side is the search. Well, once you've tagged resources, then it's got to get into search. Now, there's a little magic in between there, and, and you know, the way we, for this <laughs> demonstration activity, we took the some data that was tagged using LRMI and then pushed the learning registry, actually pushed it for an earlier project when we launched the learning registry. We took about 20,000 resources from a group called Better Lesson because they had uh, some open content and we pushed it onto the learning registry. So we took that data back and um, put it into a Lucene index and then hooked it up to our, our platform, which is BrainHoney, but this could be hooked up to uh, any search engine uh, as well. And then we just hooked on the, uh, oh, essentially the reverse of the tagging using the same controls and said here's what it might look like when you actually search for it. Um, and so this is a very early version. We have not done a pure UI design on this. This is just not potato salad, but it's, it's getting there. Um, I guess what comes before potato salad? Just potatoes? Potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> just boiling water. Boiling water. Yeah, it's the boiling water it's demo. Yellow, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that comes after the potato salad. I think. Um, So with the potato salad demo, if you search for potato salad, no, sold. You should, uh, because we're in education, we don't actually receive anything. So that does, our potato salad now has to be changed to a, a newer demo called fractions. And then we run a search. Um, we get a set of results uh, and across, across these, um, the search results, we, we get a results just what, similar to what you might with Google, a list of results and pictures and so forth, uh, previews and so forth. But that's, you know, the UI, like I said, is just, is just to hold together to, to show the whole process um, where you can come in here and uh, say, I want just the items for the teachers and it reduces the results. So instead of 300 or 600 results, we're down to um, 165 results. And then maybe I do typical age range of eight to 10. And it cuts it down down to about 19 results. And so the idea is that we have been able to take data, tag it, index it, bring it in, search for it, and filter it. So that's really the proof of concept where we are. Yes? Just a minor clarification. You alluded to it, but I think it's important to point out. So right now, you're seeing better lesson, right, as all of the results. Right. but. It would be a combination of all the publishers. Um, you'd be able to filter by publisher. We just happen to use that data set for, the, uh, for this particular demo. But it would be any publisher that has posted data to Learning Registry, if we're searching the Learning Registry. Um, it could be internally, it would just be your, your materials. Um, and so there's a lot of different opportunities. And again, the search engine, we're using our own index. We've indexed a lot of resources. Um, but it could be indexes that you've created or indexes from Google or Bing or Yahoo. Um, so the opportunity is not just, you know, just the UI you see here, but there's the infrastructure that we provide um, that you can extend. So I'll just finish with uh, um, a note just to remind you, we really want you to get involved. That's why I'm here. Um, we want you to start tagging content. That's why a number of folks are here. Uh, if you have any time the next day or two to come talk to us about what you might do with Search or Tagger, please contact Eric. His information is right here. It's Eric Weiss at agilix.com. Um, and we can set up some meetings. I do have a number of one-to-one -one appointments that are open in the next uh, two days uh, that can be arranged through Brittany. I seem to have uh, started the dance routine. <laughs> so. I'll finish there and let somebody else do the dancing. So thank you. I'm not gonna dance. Oh, come on, Mike.
So a few words from one of our sponsors here real quick. Right. One other thing is you don't necessarily need a third party search infrastructure to take advantage of LRMI. Um, you don't absolutely have to use learning registry. You don't absolutely have to use anything that Agilix, build, Agilix builds. You can wait for when Google, Bing, and Yahoo do put in their fancy potato salad-esque filtering on the left-hand side, whatever they're going to do. You, one of the caveats of that is it's going to be probably a little bit more general than what intense educators really need, but it might be a good first pass kind of search. So. Okay, so we have some time for questions, so go ahead. Timo. The very first field was the alignments. Uh, so is it advantageous to actually use human readable format, text format, as opposed to, let's say, fluids by the correlation services like GetGate or uh, academic benchmarks, um, or, or the codes uh, that states provide? Uh, or, or all of it, actually. Can we use all of it? So the standard takes a URL or a URI, and then from that, the search indexes can hopefully, if it's a dereferenceable URI, make sense of it, right? And they can pull out what the title of it is, a description of it is. Um, there's also a way, if there, if there doesn't happen, happen to be a URI that's available for that specific standard, um, nursing is something that comes to mind right now. They have nursing standards, educational standards, but there isn't, they don't, mint URIs and, and make those things. They have a PDF of what their standard looks like, right? Um, you can use, there's, there's a way to, I can get into it, I can actually show you what it looks like, but you can put in the title and the description of that standard, that educational standard. Um, it won't be as great as a URI standard, but it'll be usable enough. So, yeah. Really yeah. And the URI is usually uh, pointing to a node or the very last leaf of the standard if it goes down to it depends. Um, <laughs> ideally, all the very way down, but sometimes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, does the URI point to a node, a leaf, or like the root, or wherever for that educational standard? Um, it depends on what you're talking about, like how deep you want to go. But also, some standards don't have URIs that go as deep as you want to go. So that's kind of the granularity issue we were talking about before. So. Um, it depends on two factors, how deep the standards organization has the URIs and how deep you want to go, I guess. Yep. Through all of this, uh, the way the market acts and reacts, it sounds like I'm back in Catholic school, there'll be a lot of learning and a lot of punishment. So depending on how well things are described and how well they're found, Google and the others will mediate how successful the searches are. So I would, while we certainly don't enforce, we do make a lot of recommendations and we recommend you be as narrow as possible. I just wanted to add to, to reference that, that there shouldn't be an implication that there's only one standard that can be referenced for a resource. Right. So I don't want people to be misconceived by that. You can, you can actually tie it to more than one standard. Right. Yeah, in the standard ease, in the, the international standard organization standard ease, it's, they are repeatable. You can repeat any of these terms as many times as you want on the content. So it can be up to however an infinitely number of standards that this thing aligns to if you have the one textbook for everything kind of thing. <laughs> the other, Steve. Uh, just following up on this point, um, the standard for curricular standards uh, is a little bit open right now. So uh, CCSSO NGA will be releasing for the Common Core Standards a metadata structure uh, which may prove to be a de facto way of talking about any educational curricular standard. Uh, but it raises this question of if you provide a URI which points to a curricular standard, what's on the other end of the line, which is partly part, part of your question, and, and so what does that look like? And I think uh, there may be uh, in said some discussion about this. And so I just wanted to point out that that, that will matter. So it's not just I have a URI which points to a curricular standard, but what, do, what metadata do you pull down on the other end of that URI call? And, and it will matter how you describe that. So if you're in the business of defining standards, you need to uh, sort of accommodate that. If you're in the business of using standards, just use the ones that other standards organizations provide. Thanks, Dave. So CEDS does have um, that defined in a standard way. Um, and it, 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 um, it has a structure that is not 
bound to a certain taxonomy so that uh, it, the, the, the structure can support early learning standards that might, may have three levels in Common Core State standards and other types of standards. So um, I, I guess that's something that uh, ideally the standards organizations would adopt CEDS and have their, um, that, that target for that URL have those, um, use that vocabulary. Brent, did you want to add something? Yeah, yeah. yeah just uh, adding to that, <clears throat> something else we need to make sure we understand is that when we say, talk about aligning to a taxonomy, uh, we, what we first think of is a taxonomy of, of learning standards or learning objectives, but uh, those alignments work for other kinds of taxonomies, uh, particularly in the Common Core, they reference um, that are in the Common Core literacy, I should say, they talk about the complexity of the text that you're working with, either that you're writing or that you're reading. And so you can align to a taxonomy of text complexity, which is different from a taxonomy of, uh, of skills, which is what we think of as learning objectives. And likewise, um, there were some changes made, not to the structure of LRMI, but to the names of the terms and, uh, and how they're used, specifically with our feedback from uh, the people in the UK, from Zoe, uh, and so on because they tend to describe things in terms of a, um, a syllabus that describes topics as opposed to the objectives that describe skills the way we do. And we wanted to make sure that the, the alignment concept was universal and fit that kind of a framework as well. And so, uh, and, and same thing, you know, we've talked about typical age range, which is the common thing across boundaries, but you can also create a taxonomy of grades, you know, of K through 12 in the case of the United States, or the, the levels that they use in uh, the different European countries. You can have a taxonomy like that, and these same attributes that you use to align to those taxonomies work regardless of what it is that you're, you're talking about. Yeah, that's great, thanks. Other questions? Yes. I, I have two questions. Okay. The first one's probably the easy one. So when should we expect to see this when we go out to Google or Yahoo or Bing? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we Due need, to the to be, uh, aforementioned complexities. Uh, yeah. 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 No, actually, the, the, the good way to think of this, um, because they are cooperating on schema.org, um, they, uh, part of the way that Google, Bing, and Yahoo get away with cooperating on schema.org without getting into antitrust is that they aren't coordinating what they do with it. They're coordinating on how you specify the metadata and they are specifically very cagey and very secretive about what they're going to do with the metadata. So um, exactly when you see the big guys uh, doing something on this, my opinion is just as soon as they see it as being advantageous and, uh, and that's what this community is about is to make it advantageous for them to get into that space. Which is, which is part of the reason why we're having a search built so we can demonstrate that it does work and the more activity you drive, you know, Google's watching everything that happens, so the more activity, and so's Bing, so's Yahoo, and in a totally non-creepy kind of way. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, so the second question has to do, how do you envision uh, the issues of sustain sustainability and maintenance being addressed? To the standard itself? To the use of all of this information that gets you know, everything that gets tagged and incorporated, you know, because standards change, things happen. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, this, this is a, a, probably a bad answer to a good question, but uh, I'll, I'll attempt it anyway. Um, the, when I, uh, sometimes when I introduce an LRMI, I point out that if 10 years ago somebody had come to me and said that you can take a data set that uh, is inconsistent, that's delivered by millions of different individuals with no coordination uh, in how they put it up there, uh, that uh, violate the, uh, the best practices regularly and in sometimes deliberately so in order to manipulate things to their advantage, and you would take a data set like that and actually make it work and be useful for people, I would have uh, been very doubtful, but in fact that's what Google and Bing have proven to us in the last few years is that you can take massively inconsistent systems and actually do very good things with them. So, uh, so the general answer is um, there will be coordinated efforts to try and curate, to try and do updates to, to the frameworks, um, but it's an imperfect system and surprisingly we can make an imperfect system work actually very effectively. Right. 
We've also had internal discussions uh, within LMY about how our continued governance will go and how the bodies and boards will be formed, et cetera. So that, we spent a lot of time in Seattle talking about that. So we're, we're aware, a lot of us have deep and long painful standards backgrounds and the scars to prove it, so. And AEP and Creative Commons are not going anywhere soon. Yeah. I mean, sustainability long term, like 100 years, we can talk about that later. But for the next few years, we'll be around and definitely helping anyone who is implementing LRMI any way we can within reason. We have a question back here. Yes, I, uh, ooh, that was close. Uh, so, speaking of inconsistent systems, uh, and you spoke about not being prescriptive in how people uh, apply metadata, or rather, what they say about uh, standards. Uh, given that this is the 1.0 spec, what are you expecting to learn, or what areas are you expecting a lot of uh, surprises from? Well, if we were expecting them, there wouldn't be surprises. <laughs> um, but Greg, you're, you're closer to the specific yeah. tag. Um, I don't. So in conversation with the wider semantic web community and schema.org in particular, they don't seem to be having any real qualms with how we have described or set out the standard, what our descriptors are and what our definitions of those descriptors are. Um, so along those lines, like any like changes post 1.0, um, I don't I mean, maybe I forgot a comma somewhere, but I really doubt it. Like, I don't think it's going to be anything whatsoever, um, knock on wood. But um, does that at all answer the question? I mean, like, there's surprises of what people will put in those fields, definitely, that whole organic search thing. And we'll, and one of the, so this is actually some kind of interesting information. Um, Schema.org will provide a way of seeing what people put in some fields. So for some of the high, more highly used metadata fields, they'll make a way that you can get like a very cursory summary of usage of that field. So like what people are putting in it. Are they using Common Core? Are they using nursing standards? Are they, whose nursing standards are they using? Which URLs are they using kind of thing? Um, so they'll, pr they'll expose that information in a very, very general sense because exposing it too detailedly, you know, it, hurts their search market. So they'll be there somewhere, like some information so that we can see how the standard evolves over time. And then based off that feedback, we can make it more granular as needed or what have you, so. Like with anything else on the web, usage is gonna drive. So one last question, I think, right, Michael? Uh, go ahead. Go. Hi, um, my question is more surrounding um, media type and interactive type. Um, you know, with with uh, you know, new technology, we know that these um, taxonomies are expanding very rapidly, and I, it seems very vague in the realm of games, interactive uh, video, uh, video that uh, maybe geotagged in these emerging areas. So, how are we? Um, you know, how are uh, companies that are really trying to push the envelope in terms of these new technologies? How should we be tagging our information so that it's not just lumped into the video or the you know or, or whatever type is, you know was was seen there? Mm -hmm. Well, so one part of that is Schema.org is fairly um, nuanced and very uh, detailed in what types of media are there. Like it does, I believe it has a game part. It also has videos and movies and TV shows and et cetera, et cetera. So most likely, I think what you have would probably fit into it. If it doesn't, then you're awesome and you're like somewhere that people aren't at yet and you'll probably be found because of that maybe. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's fairly robust and if there's a community out there, Schema.org will respond to it in some timely manner. Yeah, you need to keep in mind that the yeah. tags we've talked about make that really cool thing you're working on an educational thing. Right. So the, that's why I was going, using the thing over and over again. So as you describe the thing, that's in the schema.org realm, and then the educational attributes are in the LRMI yeah. realm. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to make that just very specific type, because it may not be totally obvious, which is schema.org has a, a, a very large set of data structures. LRMI is a proposed extension to schema.org, and so everything, like schema.org defines a thing called a creative work, and there's a whole bunch of things you can talk about creative works that of which LRMI has now extended creative work to say, oh, and there are educational things that you need to know about a creative work, but you don't have to just use the educational things. Some of the things you're talking about, you're like, oh, look, it's educational and it's a game. And so you, you can inherit from both of those 
properties in creative work. Great. So it's a dessert topping and a floor wax. Isn't that the Saturday Night Live piece? Um, I really want to thank this panel. I think there's a lot of good knowledge that was here and expertise. And I mean, I think despite how bright and sharp and on it all of them are, this is leading edge stuff. Um, we've been doing it for a long time. I think we know a lot about how to do it. And again, it's absolutely critical that you, members of the publisher community, get engaged and involved as part of this process, because that's the only way it's going to be usable. So um, what we're going to do is uh, take uh, 45 minutes for lunch. Um, lunch is Pan American Room right next door. And we'll be coming from, right? Yes. That's the disco? I've been into it, yeah. So, um, and then we're going to get back together and we're going to talk about some of the high level topics, actually some of them get pretty deep, around actually implementing LRMI, um, how that's going to take place. And Lee Wilson will be leading us through some of that. So, have a great lunch. <laughs>